Well, welcome everyone to Colloquium on this beautiful spring day, and I promise this is going to be a good one. My name is Connie Pascal, and I'm the instructor for MI Colloquium and the coordinator of these lectures. Uh, and today we are in for a treat as our guest lecture is the one and only Joyce Valenza. And this is going to be the inaugural episode of her new colloquium series called Library Tech Talks with Joyce Valenza. So let's quickly go over what to expect today. First of all, thank you all for attending. And please do know that there is a publicly available video of this presentation that will be posted to the MI Colloquial playlist, which you can find on the RUCOM Info YouTube channel. Also, we'd ask you to stay muted throughout the presentation, uh, but do engage with each other through chat and with Q&A. And if possible, put your questions in the Q&A function and uh, put chat uh, for networking and for sharing information. So here's our agenda for today. So Joyce is gonna bring you up to speed on her exploration of generative AI. And then our incredible panel of experts will each give you a brief presentation about what they're doing. So we're gonna start with Chris Harris, who is our K through 12 education and school library expert. And Chris is joining us from an airport lounge somewhere in DC. So thanks in advance for taking time, making time for us. We really appreciate it. Next up is Sovic Ghosh. Vic is an information science research expert from San Jose State and a Sky PhD. Uh, Joyce will be filling you in more about his background in a little bit. Uh, and then we have Professor John Pavlik from the Sky Journalism Program, who will be addressing the impact of AI on the writing professions. Their presentations will be followed by a panel discussion and then audience Q&A, uh, and then followed up with some uh, closing comments. So without further ado, let me bring on the one and only Joyce Valenza, one of Sky's rock star professors and a nationally known expert on library technology, among her many other talents. Many of you are on this call because you know her or are here because of her. Uh, so Joyce's day job is being an associate teaching professor at Sky and the coordinator of the library, uh, school library and LIS concentrations. But today, she is fearlessly exploring the changes and challenges in the information landscape. So Joyce's first foyer into this wild new world is to explore generative AI in libraries, education, writing, and research. And with that, please welcome Joyce Valenza. Well, Connie, thank you for that very generous introduction. I'm very excited about seeing everybody here in the audience, so many of the folks we know from our classes, for, as colleagues out in the state and, and beyond, uh, and the wonderful panel we have. Let me see if I can get my slideshow started here. Um, uh, we're going to be sharing the resources with you, um, so I don't want you to get stuck on this slide just because it has the tiny URL and the uh, QR code. It, the slide will come around again, and we'll make sure that everybody gets the resources. Uh, and as you can see, we played a little bit around with getting our visual images or avatars um, using um, generative AI. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Just make sure the pictures are in the way. Um, I have a feeling everybody will have uh, their own definition of generative AI. Just basically, according to Techopedia, generative AI is a broad label that's used to describe any type of artificial intelligence that can be used to generate new text, images, video, audio, code, or synthetic data. So I, we were actually talking about this uh, before most everybody came in. We're wondering what type of disruption this is. Is it an iPhone moment? Does everybody, I don't, I don't know if everybody remembers 2007 when the iPhone was introduced, or is it a Napster moment? Does everybody remember what happened when Napster was introduced and we thought the music industry was going to collapse? What's really important to note is if we look at generative AI, this is the very beginning of its growth. It was introduced actually in November, 2022, but I think it was brewing way before that. And people who are way smarter than I, I am can talk better about the history of it. But I believe this baby is going to grow 
like crazy. And I think we need to keep an eye on it. And this may not be the only uh, colloquium we do with this theme. I want you to know that I have been obsessed with this. I have been gathering um, as many articles as I could find on this to try to understand this and introduce it to my classes in a thoughtful way. And I've been gathering other collections. So if you look um, on the top two links, you'll see that the first one is, this is on the issues relating to AI in general, but the first two collections are on AI tools and they're subject divided or, or format divided. And then the second one is a collection of AI search tools. Um, the one that everybody's talking about right now is chat GPT, but as you'll see in a second, there are so many um, different platforms that are, are being generated right now. Um, in terms of search, among the concerns with chat GPT is we don't know where the sources are coming from, but there's a whole new age of search engines that are evolving. And I've been playing with those. I want you to discover them on your own. Some of them are for academic scholarship and, and really play with citation chaining and visualizations um, and, and generated summaries and abstracts. And I urge you to take a good look at some of these and see if they fit with your practice or your research. I, I'm sure that many of you have been looking and playing with the new Bing chat, and I have been um, using that for research as well. And then um, I, I suspect some of you were on top of this before me and have already gotten your BARD, your BARD preview. I am just waiting for it. So um, you'll, have to, you'll have to share in the discussion what you think of it. Um, this is not really all that new. A few years back, I got super excited about one of Google's experiments called Google Talk to Books. If you ask it a natural language question, it will respond in, in the way any book that, ha that addresses that would respond. And it's really great because you get deep into the text of books, unlike Google Books, where you get these little snippets. It will get you directly to the questions and you can read the context around the result, which I think is, is very helpful. Uh, in JSTOR, for instance, um, they've been playing around with a tool called the Text Analyzer. So if you drag a paper into that or you find a paper in JSTOR that you love, put it into the Text Analyzer, it'll, it'll give you the keywords that your article has in common with others. You can edit the keywords. Um, you can talk about how much emphasis you want those terms to have, and you can refine your search and get even better connected articles. In addition, there are so many different tools in art and music and writing and speech and slide generation, um, and I've just been collecting and playing around with them on, in that collection. AI has been part of my life for quite a while right now. Um, I've been using Google Lens as a translation tool. When I find where somebody's wearing a fabulous outfit, I'll take a picture and figure out where they got that. Um, I've been using Grammarly per, religiously with my own writing. I use Otter AI when I take transcripts and, and collect qualitative data. And I think it's one of my best transcription tools. And I am excited about, I'm, I'm studying Spanish on Duolingo, and I'm excited about the, um, the improvements that the AI tool is going to add to Duolingo. I'm also excited about what's changing in uh, both of the major tools I use for writing and presentation. Um, Microsoft 365 Copilot will allow us, for instance, in PowerPoint to get our slides more easily generated and then we can fill in the content. Uh, I have no idea what that looks like. It's going, it's coming out very shortly, as is, um, I, I think it's called, I forget what it's called, but it's the, the, uh, the uh, iOS and Google equivalent um, that AI is going to be incorporated in, in a similar way, we think, in terms of the workspace. And by the way, I think a lot of people have really grabbed uh, onto Bing's AI chat, uh, but I was speaking to Barry Schwartz of the Search Engine Roundtable, and he said, oh, you have no idea how good the Google tools are going to be. Just wait. I was kind of thinking there would be a full migration to Bing, but he said it's not going to happen. Um, in terms of education, among the new tools that are coming out are tools like Talking Point. So if you are a teacher or a librarian who's writing to an entire class or an entire school, if you've entered the names and the language spoken by their parents or grandparents into um, a spreadsheet, 
it will automatically translate those messages into the home language of the people you're trying to communicate with and then translate their responses back to you. That's just one of the improvements. Um, I, in working with the blind, there is a tool called My Eyes. Take, if, if a blind person connects with partners around the world and shows you something that they cannot see, for instance, the, one of the examples they give is a milk carton and the, uh, the person who has a, a, a visual um, impairment can't see the expiration date, they can call on a friend and shoot a video or if a still image of the milk carton and that per that person can support them by reading the expiration date. All right, so now I have some confes confession in my AI conf confessions. And so I made this one um, using Dali and my prompt was a woman with reddish brown curly hair confessing a secret in a stained glass window in the style of the impressionist. And I think that was pretty interesting. So in my confessions, um, another Dali prompt, um, AI or generative AI has become a bit of starter dough for me. Um, I've had it write songs for me, including this song par parody in my AI confessions. I have it draft emails. And this is one that some of my students may recognize because I was introducing a guest a few weeks back. But, you know, it's a good, it's starter dough for me. It's, um, it's a beginning editor for me. One of the things it just doesn't have is my quirkiness and nothing it does is going to replicate that. And my students would absolutely recognize an email generated by, um, by an AI generation tool. However, I'm using it in my assignments. So some of you who have taken the search class may recognize the assignment on creating a Google programmable search engine. And what this has done is it's allowed my students to more quickly identify searchable portals that they could pull together in a Google programmable search. And so my example of that was from a forest student from last semester um, to find me the major research portal, portals on knitting. And it actually identified the ones that she identified through a much longer search last semester. And it did a great job this semester in getting my students started on that project. For readers advisory, it's a pretty good tool. So what I was working on with this um, was creating an annotated list of Afrofuturist books for young adults. And that gave me a pretty good list, but I wanted a better list. So then I started saying, well, can you give me instead um, a well-reviewed list of Afrofuturist titles? And I put the hyphen in instead to see, just to see if it would give me any differences. And then I asked for an award-winning list. And in this case, it gave me the awards that the books won, which gave, you know, gave me a little bit more credibility in believing what it was doing. And then I said, could you translate the list into Ukrainian? And it did that for me in uh, just a few seconds, which is a really helpful tool as we, as we encounter so many more immigrant families in our libraries and our schools. Now, you may say maybe these books are not available in Ukrainian, which probably would be a very good thing for you to say because uh, they probably aren't yet, or maybe they are. But I compared that to what would happen if I entered that in my high school destiny catalog or if I entered that in my world cat. And what I got were books on Afrofuturism, but I didn't get, because I don't think our tags are there yet, and I don't think the subject headings are there yet, I wasn't able to actually get good lists of books that way. However, one of the things about generative AI is it's not, it has a date limit, and it, it doesn't reach beyond paywalls at this point, as, to, as far as I know. And so our searches on Novelist Plus um, did a very good job as well and gave us different and more I mean, kind of premium content, which would be what I expected. Um, it also helps me with reader's advisory. I asked it for read-alikes for The Hate You Give, and it gave me a, a darn good list of books I happen to love. I've also asked it to help create glossaries for my classes. Now, these aren't perfect. They're not exactly the terms I would use. I might feed it new terms, but it gave me a pretty decent list of terms relating to search for my search class. And then I asked it to reduce the text complex or complexity of the glossary. So I asked it to give me a simplified version of the annotated glossary for a fifth grade level reader. Now, you may argue that for a graduate class, that's not, that shouldn't be necessary, but I did want to just show you how you can change text complexity in a document. And then I, I have a feeling Dr. Harris will be disappointed in finding out how much I got involved with the AI time machine. 
but I absolutely loved putting 10 photos in there and seeing what I would look like as an ancient Greek person and um, as a cowgirl and um, as a Viking and all sorts of things. And that has been, that was $12, but it was so much fun. Um, my dad died when I was 19 and I have no video of him. But what I was able to do was um, upload some photographs of my dad and then I could see his face move and watch, imagine this is how he might have looked at me, which I know it sounds corny and crazy, but it, it, and it was a little freaky, but I love doing that. Um, we are seeing different reactions from, about generative AI, understandably, from various different communities. Um, in the art community, we've had controversy over whether our AI-generated art can be trademarked and if it indeed is art and how it might be used. And we're also seeing artists getting uh, quite upset about their own work being used in data training and showing up in results in AI, AI-generated art. So this is only one of the controversies. Um, we this was announced only recently. Adobe added to its Adobe Express suite, Adobe Firefly, which really respects the work of creators and doesn't and, and promises not to use copyrighted art in its data training. But I, it also does video. And one of the amazing things it, it did in the example I showed on that slide, which I will get back to, is that um, it changed the image in this video from a little barn, I think, in the summertime, and they they presented it again as a video in the wintertime. I don't know how this works. In the education community, we're thinking about how AI may make teachers' lives easier, how it can support teaching and learning, how we might rethink assessments if we need to, and how we can maintain creative cultures of academic honesty while productively using the tools that we have available to us in our time. Um, teachers like Monica Burns from New Jersey has created little books on, uh, um, on ways to save, save teachers time. And again, again, some of the examples are email reminders and simplifying your writing, as I described. Um, this is Edutopia's idea for, for some of the tools. I have been using the lesson planning tools. Um, this is one of the lesson plans I created uh, as a, a sample. I, I told it to use the next generation science standards. I put my learning objectives in. I said I wanted some interactive activity suggestions and it did a pretty darn good um, job. I would not use this right off the shelf, but it gave me a start in writing a pretty good lesson plan. Um, and folks are creating new norms and, and rules about academic honesty. This one just came out from the International Bar Baccalaureate Program. And this one is from um, Matthew Miller of Ditch That Textbook. Uh, and he has this scale of how to think about plagiarism cheating and how to think about co-writing and, and what academic honesty looks like when you're using these tools. And so I urge you to take a look at Matthew's work. Um, this is an amazing new tool from Khan Academy. This is a, a full unit for teachers on how to teach with, uh, with uh, ChatGPT. Um, and they show you three different examples. The third and the one that's recommended is how to use it as a co-editor. And that's more from Khan Academy. And here are just uh, my list of general concerns that I've gathered from the literature. We are concerned about the accuracy of information, uh, the authority, the uh, provenance of what we're getting, the information that is not being found behind pay payrolls, what's not being included in general results, who owns the data, are the data that are collected private, is the history of my chat GPT prompts private? I don't know the answers to any of these things. Um, is this really a how moment? This is uh, Sam Altman, who is a CEO, uh, one of the CEOs of ChatGPT, and he made a confession on several of the news shows. Recipe. But is this also a recipe for something else, replacing jobs with technology? You've said AI will likely eliminate millions of jobs. Many people are gonna ask, why on earth did you create this technology? I think it can do the opposite of all of those things, too. It is going to eliminate a lot of current jobs. That's true. We can make much better ones. The reason to develop AI at all is that I, I believe this will be, uh, in terms of impact on our lives and improving our lives and upside, this will be the, the greatest technology humanity has yet developed. 
So in the wrong human hands, it could be a very different device. It could be a very different power. We do worry a lot about authoritarian governments developing this and using it. Russia, China. Are you speaking to the government? Oh, yes. Are you're in regular contact? Regular contact. And do you think they get it? More and more every day. Well, we'll have some conversation about that, I suspect. Now, back now to the introductions. Um, Connie did introduce me, but I we played around a little bit with getting chat GPT to create our introductions. Um, this is what it came up with for me. In this very short paragraph, there are three errors. I'm no longer teaching at Springfield Township High School. I'm not an adjunct professor, and I don't even know about the book that it says I wrote. So that was inaccurate, but here are some accurate introductions of our panelists. Dr. Christopher Harris is the director of the School Library System for the Genesee Valley BOCES, an educational service supporting the libraries of 22 small rural districts in Western New York. He was a participant in the first American Library Association Emerging Leaders Program in 2007 and was honored as a library journal mover and shaker in 2008. In 2022, Dr. Harris was named a senior fellow for the American Library Association for School Libraries and Youth Policy Issues. Dr. Harris received his EDD from St. John Fisher College in 2018 for dissertation research on helping teachers become more confident uh, teaching computer science. And he goes by Inframency. I hope I said that right at gmail.com. And he created his um, um, profile picture using Canvas text to image with that, that prompt there, male librarian with glasses and blonde hair. And Chris uh, has an IMLS grant in, uh, that he is, uh, that, that's brilliant. I hope he does mention it. And in his resources, which are listed here, he has a bunch of wonderful tools, including two page resources for administrators and educators on using AI, generative AI. And I was so happy to meet um, Vic. He is an assistant professor, Vic is an assistant professor at the School of Information, San Jose State University. He's a mixed method researcher who combines interdisciplinary contacts, concepts from artificial intelligence, machine learning, and human computer interaction. Um, HCI to improve voice-based assistance and design systems for social good. He developed automated AI solutions for complex socio-technical problems such as cyberbullying, fake news, community question answering, and PII or personally identifiable information disclosure. His co-authored paper on leveraging music recommendation for therapeutic purposes was nominated for the best paper at the 2022 Information Seeking in Context Conference. By applying user-centered research design and ethical AI, Ghosh claims to make future intelligence systems more human-like, user-friendly, and accessible for end users. Uh, Vic completed his PhD at Rutgers School of Sky in 2020, and his contact Ooh. information is there, and he knows Connie very well. And finally, our last uh, panelist is John Pavlich. And John is a professor of journalism and media studies at Sky. Uh, and he, John writes studies and writes on the impact of new technology on journalism, media, and society. His books include Disruption and Digital Journalism, Journalism in the Age of Virtual Reality, and Journalism and New Media. Uh, he has a PhD in mass communications, and uh, it's from the University of Minnesota. And John recently wrote an article um, which I think he co-wrote with artificial intelligence uh, with, with ChatGPT. So um, I'm going to stop sharing right now. Uh, you will come, we'll come back to this so you can get the slides afterwards. But um, Chris, why don't you take it away? You ready to screen share? Yeah, give me just a second here, pull up. All right, hello everybody. So I'm coming to this from the perspective of a school library system director. So I am a certified school administrator in New York State, same certification as superintendents. Uh, last year I was the principal director uh, creating a new online academy for our regional educational services agency. So that's the lens that I'm coming from, uh, school library, but with that administrative perspective. Um, as Joyce mentioned, I, I have created a lot of resources around uh, ChatGPT specifically. 
when I'm talking about this, I'm going to a lot of districts to talk about it right now, help districts think about this. How are they going to approach this? I'd love to start with this quote from Mrs. Um, as he says, look, AI is now good enough. It's pretty much covered with good enough. Um, so what we're then looking at is humans are still going to be that, that great. Humans are still going to be that innovation. Well, good enough is going to be the realm of AI. And I think, you know, that, that's what Sam Altman was alluding to when he didn't come right out and say this is going to be an incredible disruption, uh, especially on white collar creative work. You know, we, we've talked in the past about, um, you know, disruptions to blue collar work from automation, from uh, robotics, but this is disruption to white collar creative work. I wanted to really explore what are the benefits and risks, and we looked at some of them. But you know, AI is really good at coming up with what are the things. It, it is amazingly self-aware in terms of, of what it does and and what its dangers are, and and I, I find that that incredibly amusing. Um, so Joyce mentioned some of these, so I'm just going to go through a couple of examples that, that really I've been highlighting the educational and school library world as some of our best ways to make effective use of this. The differentiated text complexity is an incredible game changer. That's a very complicated task to complete. Um, it can take text and, and differentiate it down to whatever desired level. What is very nice about it um, is that it does it quickly and you can you know, go through it and monitor it and edit and rewrite the prompt to make sure that it's not leaving out key details but it's lowering the text complexity. And that's something that, you know, teachers spend a, a very you know, large amount of time doing. Uh, there are also some paid database resources that do this, but not a lot. And so that's a huge benefit. Um, one of the other things that I've really been playing around with is using AI to evaluate essays. Now, computer-graded essays are not new. Um, College Board has been doing this for SAT and other things for, for quite a while, but it was always sort of word-based review of the essay. And this is much more holistic in terms of looking at the essay. And, and there's a much greater ability to prompt uh, the AI, to preload the AI, sort of pre-train in your session the AI. So I looked at uh, the 2021 U.S. Regents for New York State. Uh, U.S. History Regents, and I, I set up the session in ChatGPT by giving it the task definition, giving it the two documents that were included in the task, giving it the scoring notes, and giving it all of the elements for the rubric in a five-point rubric. And after that, I then started uh, dropping in anchor papers that have been human-assessed uh, in the scoring manual from uh, New York State. It nailed all of the scores. It, it got them all correct. The only one, it, it was confused as to if it should give one of the papers a one or a two. Uh, human raters had given it a one. The AI was maybe willing to be a little more generous and give it a two. One of the issues uh, that, that we obviously have to talk about with AI is bias. But I think we also have to look at human bias, because one of the things that, that definitely was immediately noticeable when I then took this and said, hey, based on what you've learned from evaluating these essays, can you give me a sample essay that would be written at a level three? Could you give me a sample essay written at a level five? It was able to do that, but the essays generated by the AI were much shorter. So if you've ever looked at sort of essay evaluation um, for these standardized tests, what you'll find out very quickly is that there is a almost perfect correlation between essay length and the score that the essay receives. And so human scores are being given this unintentional bias in their training that a short essay is going to have a lower score. But ChatGPT doesn't look at the brevity of the essay, it's looking at the content uh, and, and sort of the semantics of the words found therein. And so it is more likely to give even a briefer essay a higher score. Now, is it perfect? Uh, probably not. And there, there's some emerging uh, research. There was a website, uh, No More Marking, that just put out a little uh, 
brief research study that, that they tried to do, they were looking at younger students, students writing and found that the AI did not perform as well. It was not, um, it didn't match up with the readers. I wonder if it was because it was a lower score. Here we're looking at 11th grade uh, writing samples. And the 11th grade writing samples, it did a, a, a rather nice job. So my plan is to go further and give it more sample papers, um, you know, try and give it a larger data set and see how well it matches up over time. But there is that ability, you know, if you talk to English teachers or, or anybody else, the ability of the AI to not only evaluate the essays, but then the real kicker is to provide specific actionable feedback. And, you know, when you look at the, 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 the feedback it gives, it's good feedback. These are great points to take that essay from a three to a level four or level five on the rubric. And this is the type of thing that saves teacher time uh, in, in a really key way. And so that's absolutely huge and, and I think a really big potential. Now, Joyce mentioned lesson plans as well. And the lesson plans that it writes are definitely good enough. But what's really important and what I've been trying to explain to school administrators and instructional leaders is that the benefit here is with novice teachers because it can take that lesson plan and if you are aware of the pedagogy, if you are able to give it the prompt, you can have it take that lesson plan and rewrite it in a direct explicit instruction model using I do, we do, you do model. You can do constructivist learning. You just have to give it the pedagogy. So we have to engineer the prompts. And, and I like to use this as the whole knowing where to tap model. Um, so there's that, that whole, you know, a powerful story of you know somebody charging because they, they they knew where to tap and it's not the tapping that's expensive it's the knowing where to tap so daisy christodolu um had just a, some great blog posts about how do we deal with this education and her real step one was don't overreact yes ai is very good at the basic academic skills we're teaching but that doesn't mean we stop teaching those um, the, the biggest thing that I've been telling teachers when I talk to them is look, go talk to the math teachers in your school because math teachers dealt with this five, six years ago when photo math came out. That's the app on the phone where you take a picture of the math homework and it just does it all for you and shows the work and everything. So you ask math teacher, did you stop teaching math? No. Did you change how you assign and assess math? Yes. And that's absolutely the key here that the answer is going to be to focus on the process, not on the product, the process of learning. And, and I think, you know, we saw that with Joyce's uh, allusions to assignments um, and, and ways to really work that in, where we need to look at the process. So we tell teachers, you know, don't freak out, uh, but focus on the process, not the product. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was wonderful. I, I, I loved your example of, of the, the, the pedagogy in the lesson plan that makes such a difference. Um, oh, wait a second. <laughs> I thought I was muted. Well, okay, let's have Vic join us now. Vic, are you ready to go? Yes, yes, okay. I am. I'm just <laughs> trying to share my screen. Okie dokie. Okay. okay. Folks, make sure you start thinking about questions. So I have a quick question while we're getting ready. So if there's an essay that has infactual information in it, will the AI correct it? Like incorrect information? You would probably have to ask it to review the essay for inaccurate information. Interesting, okay. And that prompt engineering is a skill that I don't think we've really thought about very much before. Vic, are you ready? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. Please. Okay. I, yeah, no, and again, uh, thanks, uh, Joyce, for organizing this. And Chris, your, uh, your presentation was really wonderful. And I do have a few questions for you, and we'll probably circle back to that uh, at the end of uh, John's presentation. So, yeah, so I was excited when Joyce invited me, and I felt like the I've been talking a lot about generative AI, chat GPT. And uh, funnily, ChatGPT, OpenAI follows a very strong marketing and advertising policy. So ChatGPT is the one which became more popular than others. Uh, 
Uh, but generative AI has been there and we have been noticing different capabilities which it has uh, it has and also the various disadvantages the biases the the problems which are associated with it and uh, i have been talking about this for last six months or so and so yep yeah, so let's let's go ahead and get started so again joyce mentioned what generative ai is and i i still thought that i would like kind of like nudge on that point a little bit more so now it's it's an ai model right it's an ai system which can generate completely original content now it's it's not completely original it uses its training data to come up with something which is new, which hasn't been done before. And it could be images, text, music, video, uses the training data to kind of keep it as close as human as possible. And they're using complex deep learning algorithms at the back end. So we have neural networks, which, which are mostly black box models. And it's trying to analyze, learn from those large data sets and generating new content. Now you can see, I have also put a discriminative, uh, discriminative, discriminative, uh, models as well so there's a difference between the two i for one i i generate natural language processing text because i work with conversational ai so i do need to generate uh, human like text from time to time but i do work with various classification algorithms and discriminative algorithms ex allow you to do exactly that so you can actually draw a decision boundary saying this belongs to this class and here's which belongs to another class now the fact that chat gpt or gpt 3.5 it's a it's a generative model doesn't mean we cannot use it for discriminative purposes as well. So we call that inference model. And I have been using a lot of it for inferencing based on the data sets. Like, can you ask, uh, you can ask your GPT to give you the sentiment of the text. You can ask it to see if it contains biases or not. You can ask it if it contains uh, personally identifiable information in the text. And again, we have spoken about prompt engineering and I'll again go back to the prompt engineering. But from a very high level mathematical point of view, I think uh, generative models are mostly joint probabilities where we are trying to figure out where the labels are, which data kind of satisfies that. Whereas uh, discriminative models, you can think of it as a more uh, conditional probability. So given a particular data set, you're trying to figure out what label it belongs to. Okay. And here are some of the examples. And I just wanted to put it out there in case you want, you are excited about technology like I am and choices and you want to just go around and play with some of them so gpt3 lambda they're they're mostly text generation algorithms so uh, sure. they will generate text for you Vic, real quick um your slides aren't okay aren't advancing okay okay did we or was it not supposed to advance no it was supposed to uh, let me see wow a lot of parameters Okay, so can you see my screen now? You can see generative AI refers to okay. artificial okay. intelligence. That, that's good. Yeah. And then, yeah, so you can see the text generation model. So we have like GPT-3, we have uh, Lambda from Google. Then we have text to video. So you can ask it to generate video for you. And uh, Google has the Finaki. Soundify is another one. Then there's text to audio models. And I've used Whisper, which is again by OpenAI. And I actually have a code written if any of you want to work with it. So it can, you can actually talk on your microphone. It can transcribe it for you. It can translate it for you from uh, any other language to English. Mine one only works to English. So if you want to work on that, you can. And there's Jukebox, which is also by OpenAI. I, ha I haven't used Jukebox myself. But then there's text to code like uh, Codex and Alpha Code. I heard that Codex has uh, made it non-open last week. I'm not too sure, I'll have to check. And then you have text to scientific text, Galactica and Minerva, they are also, they can, you can ask, give them text and ask them to generate it more like how you do in an overlay. And then there's DALI2, which, which we have all used to generate our images. There's Stable Diffusion, which is an open source. And then there's a Flamingo model, which generates from other way, from images, it will generate text for you. It will try to explain your uh, images. Now, I just wanted to highlight the number of training parameters we have, and that kind of directly links to one of the challenges or limitations I will point out later, because this is 540 billion training parameters, and this is being used by Palm, which is the Pathways uh, language model by Google. And uh, similarly, GPT 3.5, it's using 175 billion parameters. The Lambda model uses 137 billion parameters. So they're all using huge number of training parameters, which also requires 
an enormous amount of computing resources, enormous amount of training time and cost. And I think Sam Altman himself mentioned that the cost of running or training these models is eye-watering. That's the exact word which he used. And uh, which kind of isolates researchers like uh, you and I, like people who work in academia, we don't usually have access to millions of dollars in just to run these models, develop those models. So that's definitely an equity concern in terms of the replicability and the reproducibility of this result. So uh, can we train a similar model? We probably can if you are in MIT or in Stanford, but for people who are in not one of those elite institutions, I think it's extremely hard to replicate just this experiments. And we can see like there, there's some of the other ones and you can see the tra training tokens and, and the parameters, which are extremely huge. This was an image which was created by Midjourney and they launched their version five. And the one on the left is by their version four and one on the right is V5. I thought of a trick question. I thought of asking the audience, one of them is captured by an actual photographer. Tell me which one. And, but none of them are. And I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't play with trick questions here <laughs> when I'm presenting. And you can see the prompt is right at the bottom. And this is actually, again, like the job shift, which, which I think uh, Ortman talks about. Uh, if you're a photographer and you're trying to capture those wonderful images, now how safe is your job? Because Midjourney is producing this kind of images, which, which, are, which are right. I probably won't be. I, I am a professional, not professional, but a hobbyist photographer. And these are some of the images which I'd be really proud to replicate when I'm running around with my camera. And so th this is wonderfully done. And again, this is another picture, which is a street style photo of a busy New York City bodega filled with people standing by the deli counter. I would never imagine that this has been generated by the AI. And it's, it looks as if I could even see some blur in the image, which would look like as if the, the cameraman didn't have a steady hand. It shook a little bit or the people were moving. So one of, one of those. Whisper, another one of those models which I mentioned for translation, transcription, they have been trained on 680,000 hours of training data. And an average human being, if we live for 80 hours, 80 years, and we have 65 days a year, and on an average, if we are awake for 16 hours every day, we listen to 467,200 hours of audio. And so this model, the Whisper model trained by OpenAI has almost 45% more data than any human hears in his lifetime or her lifetime. So this is again, like the amount of training data is just enormous. And again, one of the questions I get asked often is why does ChatGPT work so well? And I have just shown the evolution of uh, ChatGPT which started with the GPT-2 and GPT-1 series. And you could see that this, this model is the codex initial so the model is being trained on the code itself. So it tries to find out what the code does. On the other side, we have the in initial instruct GPT model, which is being trained on how to follow instructions. So when you think of GPT-3, what was, what was there initially, the goal was very similar to a Markov model. You are trying to predict the next word based on a massive training text corpus. So I give you the fox jumped over the, and you say moon, because you would just know how to complete the text. Now, what they figured out very well is how we can use that as part of a reasoning or a translation experience. And uh, few short learning is, is one of the, again, uh, I'm, I'm digressing from my original point, but few short learning is where you give the model few examples of showing the labels. You said, this is a positive, this is a negative sentence, or this is right, this is wrong. And then it uses those examples to generalize on a large training data based on what it has been pre-trained on. And as you can see, the instruction tuning branch, it can follow the instructions. That's why we can do those prompt engineering. The code branch gives it those insights based on the code itself. And then they kind of combine them into the DaVinci 2, and then finally use some kind of supervised instruction tuning, which they are calling RLHF, reinforce learn, reinforcement learning with human feedback. So we, a human is kind of providing some kind of feedback. And that's, that's how the DaVinci 003 and the ChatGPT model came into being. And right now they also have the GPT-4. ChatGPT was the GPT-3.5, which they made available a month back, I think. And now they have the GPT-4 available as well. And now to look at the opportunity, 
opportunities so we can summarize long documents, academic articles, uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Harris, I'm also working with summarizing academic text. And that's some of the things which my students and I, we are working on. Structuring text while writing. So one of my confessions would be yesterday, I was trying to prepare the slides and I asked ChatGPT, like, oh, what should be the content of my slides? Can you give me a top level overview of what should go into which slide? So it prepared that. I didn't like it a lot. So I kind of like played around with it, but I probably using 50% of it said, you should mention the opportunity. You should mention the limitations. You should definitely mention how it works good. So I do have some of them there. They are part of my slide headers. Uh, the coding, I think someone mentioned in the chat that we could do a lot of coding explanations. We could also improve our code, rewrite them. I have some examples. Simplify, generate test cases, documenting, scaffolding. GitHub Copilot has been doing wonderfully well creating those structures, those classes. And then you could use it for more personalized things like planning a travel or creative solutions. So here's one of my code. So I just asked, this is one of the creative solutions. I do experimental user studies and I asked it to generate search tasks, which would allow me to explore users learning outcomes while searching. And then it gave me some wonderful tasks, which again, like I have to say that I could, I would have read like almost 20 papers and to just figure out some of these tasks and to see if it was the right fit. Now it has given me something. So all I need to do is verify if they're good tasks for me or not. So it has converted an NP hard problem to something which is, uh, which is not NP hard. And again, this was a code which I wrote. And again, I knew what I was doing. Uh, I wanted this for this presentation itself. So I wanted it to be done using list comprehension. So I said, simplify my code. And it combined it into one single line. So you can see it here. And then I said, can you add some error check to the code? And then it again generated the code with the error check. Now you could also translate. You could say, can you convert this Python code to Java? And again, it does wonderfully well at that. This is a work from, from my project, which I'm working. This is a famous paper, Attention is All You Need uh, by Vaswani. And I asked, I actually wrote the code using GPT 3.5 and asked it to generate this model. So which is the systematic review and systematic in the sense because it has separated out each section and it had generated this review, which is not bad at all uh, compared to some of my students in my lab who, who doesn't spend a lot of time reviewing papers. It's at par with them. Some of my other students who does a very good job reviewing, I think it's, it's still not there and it has repeated certain forms of text, but it has done still a pretty decent job at that. Like if you, if you don't have time to read the whole paper, I think it's, it's pretty good. And Sam Altman, he mentioned that we adapted to calculators and changed what we tested for in math class. This is a more extreme version of that, no doubt, but also the benefit of it are more extreme as well. And I just want to add, not just the benefit, but the harms of it are also very extreme because we are, we are applying AI for everything. And that brings us to the challenges and limitations. So hallucinations is one of the known phenomena where uh, the model, it memorizes facts because it has such a huge training parameter. So it memorizes facts. Oh, something which we can do is do some retrieval based checking. We can use an ensemble uh, GPT collection and they would play along, like they would compete with each other to kind of verify that text. Some ideas, there's this plagiarism uh, which, which we can find out there's, there's ways of implementing GPT-0, there's watermarking techniques. Again, they can be, it has been a game of whack a mole so far, but we can definitely kind of like find ways around it. Job shifts, we have spoken about it. There's, I mentioned the lack of replicability. And there's sometimes there's unethical and illegal answers. Now, funnily, I was trying yesterday to get some examples. And previously I asked it to give me some ways I can commit suicide, I can steal from my dad. And it has given me some wonderful ideas. Yesterday, it did tell me that these are all unethical and I cannot give you answers to those questions. So you are violating some of our policies. So I stopped at there. And again, political biases, it was giving you, if you asked about Donald Trump, it wouldn't comment. But if you asked it to write like a, a positive comment about Joe Biden, it would. So it definitely had some political bias. So it wasn't doing that either. It kept saying that I'm not political, so I don't want to mention anything related to politics, but these are some of the factors which could be considered as is positive. So it was also solving math problems pretty well. And previously I tried, it couldn't reason how it solved the problem. But yesterday when I did that, it, it, it worked pretty well. So it has solved some of these problems recently. And again, with regards to shifting workforce, uh, Altman says 80% of US workforce could have greater than 10% of their work affected. 
and the remaining 90% may see more than 50% of their work impacted. And some occupations, I think uh, OpenAI and UPen, they did a joint study. And they say that tax preparers, photographers, interpreters, translators, survey researchers, these are some of the jobs which are going to get affected the most. Uh, I have to go over the paper in more detail to figure out why they mentioned these professions in particular. And that's all from me. So thank you. And I could be reached at my email address here. I would end it with a quote, uh, and it's actually the name of the paper, uh, Modern Language Models Refute Chomsky's Approach to Language, if there's any linguistic linguist here. So you can actually verify if this is true or not. And I would uh, leave with that. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Um, Chomsky just did an editorial on AI um, last week. We should take a look at that. Um, okay, we are ready for Dr. John Pavlik. John, are you ready for us? Uh, sure, thank you. <laughs> All right, if you can see my screen, it should say AI journalism and the media. So I'm the, uh, I guess I'm the comic relief for this panel. <laughs> I am uh, complimentary, I hope, to the other presentations. I'm not a technologist. I'm not an AI uh, coder. I am not any of the things you've been hearing about, but I can talk about how AI has already impacted journalism and media and how generative AI, I think, you know, will continue to have that, that effect. And I'll give a little bit of historical context for this because, you know, it seems like all this is just suddenly happening now, but actually it goes back quite a ways, at least in journalism and, and media. And so, yeah, generative AI has, has the moment right now, but it's really much more than that. And I organize it into these four areas in which AI, including generative AI, impacts uh, journalism and the media. Uh, the first is in the area of content and a lot of impact in, in that arena in various forms. Uh, second, organizational aspects of uh, media and or journalistic organizations. Uh, third, the pract work practices and, and who or what is a professional uh, journalist or, or media uh, practitioner. And then the relationship between journalism and media and, and the public, uh, that's being uh, profoundly impacted as well. So in this first area of content, just some examples, and it's, it's text, yes, absolutely, and it's images, yes, but it's a lot more than that and will continue to, to grow in terms of content. Uh, and I've just been spending some time lately with Apple's uh, AI narrated audiobooks. And if you don't know that they're narrated by an AI, you would, you know, I would be very hard pressed to tell that it's not a human because the, the speaker has the nuance of a professional actor and they pronounce everything beautifully and it's, it's seamless. And so I imagine Audible uh, you know, owned by Amazon must be very, paying very close attention to what Apple's doing now because the whole premise that, you know, audiobooks have to be created by a human narrator is changing. And then if the book itself is written by an AI, that, that could really change the equation. Uh, then uh, you may remember this old TV show. It's in the Smithsonian. It's considered a national treasure. Uh, the MASH TV show with Alan Alda. They recently did a scene written by ChatGPT and then actually read by Hawkeye and BJ. So there's a lot of ways that this is affecting the world of media and entertainment in a broad spectrum. It isn't just little, little you know, uh, strange YouTube videos that were created by an AI. It's really good quality stuff. There's a new AI film and and going into production uh, called White Mirror. And and one of the things that they're able to do is reduce the the cost by a factor of at least 60. So you can create a movie for a fraction of the price if you use AI, especially in animation. But as we saw with Vic's uh, presentation, the imagery increasingly, if you look at it, unless you like study it in minute detail, it looks like a photo or it looks like a video uh, of real live action. And so, you know, movies are going to be susceptible to the same thing. And if they and if you can create the same movie instead of a hundred million dollar blockbuster, you can create the same movie for for 10 million or 15 million. It's going to be hard not to do that. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we're hearing about all this, you know, now because of the public release of these tools, but the tools have been available to media organizations for quite a few years. In fact, uh, The Guardian published a story as long ago as, as 2020 uh, with using GPT-3. Uh, now with the current version, uh, CNET and some others have published uh, stories generated by ChatGPT, but it was quickly pointed out there were some basic errors. Now, probably a lot of that will be fixed with GPT-4, but of course that's a subscription product. So companies are gonna have to pay for that. Uh, and, but I think for journalism, it'll be you know a, a good and sound investment because you don't wanna have errors that are unnecessary. Like one of the errors they pointed out that the CNET article made um, using ChatGPT is it miscalculated compound interest rates. Um, and so things like that, I'm sure a new generation, GPT-4 probably is able to fix those things. Or if what Chris was saying earlier, if you can ask GPT to correct factual errors, well, theoretically, probably you could tell ChatGPT-4 to correct its own errors before telling you the error. So maybe this is an iterative process uh, at work. But I think also for journalism, it's going to be very important that we continue to be very critical in how we report about the developments in AI, especially in generative AI and their impact, that we just don't accept this stuff from industry unquestioningly. You know, we really have to, and it's it's got a lot of attention. I mean, all the major news media are looking at it, all the specialized trade media are looking at it, but I think that's just, you know, really the beginning uh, of what we need to do to make sure this stuff doesn't bring all kinds of problems to the content because that's the thing that most is the you know defining quality of journalism and media is is the content you know the stories what we what we actually present uh to the public the organizational side as i mentioned now animated films cost a fraction and so as a as an organization fiscally if you can save you know uh uh, uh hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on every production, it's gonna be hard not to uh, uh, to do that. And so it's a matter of, uh, you know, business decisions increasingly. Now, will the quality of content be sacrificed in the process? That's, you know, that's gonna be an important question, but that's gonna be a qualitative judgment, you know? So, you know, recently everybody has been, you know, interested in how the streaming platforms do in terms of winning Oscars. Well, how long will it be until a, uh, an AI created movie wins an Oscar? That, if that's the marker of excellence, the professional practices and who or what is a journalist. So there was a study that the New York Times did of their own team, and they found that their own journalists were already using a lot of AI tools to do note taking and to do real time real time transcriptions and that technology has come so far in the last couple of years back in the 1990s when i was doing some early work with uh Kathy McEwen maybe you know her she's retired but she was professor of computer science at Columbia University and she was doing ai a uh, news summarization uh, a system they called news blaster back in 96 97 so this was 25, 26 years ago, that was really very good. I mean, uh, the, the, the big advantage they had back then is they were working from known data, news from vetted sources. And so when their system produced a uh, summary, it didn't have errors unless they were in the news already. Now, the, one of the problems with ChatGPT applied to journalism, journalistically, it can introduce all kinds of errors because it's been learning from all kinds of sources. Uh, or I, I want to pick before I forget, talking about bias and as Sam Altman, you may not have noticed, but it really tweaked my ear when he said AI was the greatest thing man ever created. And I mean, okay, well, that's your typical male sexist guy, you know, misogynistic guy out there at Google, you know, crediting AI just to men, right? Now, maybe he didn't mean that, but it is what he said. And I'm sure he's not dumb. So, you know, I highlight that fact that bias comes in many forms and it's there, especially in Silicon Valley, it has been for a long time. Uh, so, you know, all this stuff is really transforming the practices of, of journalists and of media professionals. And then the relationship with the public. And we think of this now, it's sort of like an American thing, but really it's a global thing uh, because so many of these media enterprises are global. Uh, Spotify just introduced, you know, like Apple, they introduced an AI DJ. And if you hear this AI DJ, you have no, if you didn't know it was an AI, it sounds like a person, you know? I mean, it's really, you know, he's, he's cool and all that, 
but it sounds like a person. It's not like some computer voice. I remember working back in the 90s with early speech, you know, text to speech technology. It was horrible. It had that stochastic speech. Every word sounded like this, you know, and there was no inflection. There was no nuance. You know, that's completely gone now. You know, when, they, when you're an AI speaks, it's just like you're listening to a person. Uh, South Korea is one of the leaders in this technology as well. They, they're kind of like their Google neighbor has already been doing content recommendation for a long time. And it's like, and robotics, you know, we think of this as important. Robotics converged with generative AI is, is a big thing and transforming media. And then this whole thing about, uh, you know, uh, prompt engineering. I think that should be part of our curriculum, what we teach at Sky. We probably could be out in the front of this, uh, teaching our students the new skills they need to have because AI is not gonna go away just because we think, oh, and it's gonna you know, uh, introduce error. It's here to stay and it's gonna get more and more powerful and we need to enable our students to work effectively with it. So teaching how to write a good prompt you know, to get the result you want, because you know, as we've seen, depending on how you ask it, you can get very different results. So there are a lot of problems and research topics and questions, and I'll just touch on a few here. But everybody's already said, you know, misinformation and bias, huge, deep fakes and video. And, you know, one of the things I'm worried about is, you know, you're going to get a phone call and it's going to sound, you know, like if you're a parent like I am, it's going to sound just like your daughter or your son, right? It's going to be their voice and it's going to talk like them. I created an AI using character.ai and I made it AI Pulitzer, you know, Joseph Pulitzer, and I fed in stuff about Joseph Pulitzer. And it said things like Joseph Pulitzer. He didn't like William Randolph Hearst because they had the circulation war and, you know, you're going to get this call from your kid and it's going to be your kid's voice and it's going to say the kind of things the way your child would say it. I mean, that, that's going to be voice cloning is, is going to really be, when you talk about some of those things that's scary, threats to democracy, absolutely. One of the big questions, can AI really learn to be truthful since it doesn't actually know anything? It's just following, as, as Vic said, it's a model. It's just a model, right? It, it doesn't have a clue what it's actually saying, you know? So, you know, GPT-4 may be an improvement, but we'll see. Definitely privacy threat, definitely IP theft. Copyright, how that will come into play. The Office of Copyright has already said AI can't be copyrighted, but they don't have an official ruling. But that doesn't mean that it won't play out internationally. How will the how will freedom of speech apply uh, to AI journalism? What will be the role of AI in the metaverse, which is a completely digital space? What about in gaming? Uh, this new skill, and then how do we bring ethics into all of this? You know, that's I think really be a paramount. I've been thinking about. Uh, you know, you're familiar with Isaac Asimov's three role, three laws of robotics. Well, I'm working on my own three, three laws of avatar journalists because we need a whole new way because it's going to be a lot of avatar journalists. Hedge funds now own a lot of newspapers and they don't care about journalistic excellence. They care about the bottom line. So how do we get ethics into that environment where more and more journalists, BuzzFeed's already said they're going to have a lot of AI journalists. Um, they need to, they need to save money because the belt tightening, you know, they, they don't have the resources. So that's going to, you know, be an interesting thing. So thank you. I can wow. Stop sharing. <laughs> that's a lot of questions. And it, it I, I, I know that as educators, we are all challenged by how are we going to adjust to the challenges that John and Chris and and Vic just introduced and but I do we before Chris runs to make his flight I want him if he if he has a question to ask ask his question first. What are you thinking, Chris? Or I was going to say if somebody had a question for me that that I oh, could try and answer real quick. Uh, does anybody have a question for Chris? I do have a question for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Chris, so I saw that you were working with the text summarization and uh, essay grading. So that's something which is of very much interest to me. And I was thinking of what kind of uh, evaluation are you using when it's AI generated text? Uh, are you comparing it with, uh, say, human generated text, which you are saying like that's perfect and you're comparing it with scores like blue or something similar? Or are you doing some kind of human evaluation at the end? So someone reads through them and say like, okay, this is better than the other one. 
I am not a researcher like you, Vic. So what I'm doing is comparing it to the grading um, documents created by state education departments where they put out anchor papers that have been uh, generated and human graded. So I'm just using that, that to kind of double check it um, for, for, yes, for, for the regions exams. I think there are um, many other issues. One of the things that I did note is ChatGPT itself is very bad at recognizing what it wrote. So I asked it to write sample essays at a certain targeted uh, rubric level. It did that well. And then going to the rubric, it did score correctly at those rubrics with what it wrote. I then created a new session because the teachers in the session said, well, can it tell if it wrote that? Created a new session so it wouldn't know, uh, put it in, and, and it said that was almost assuredly written by a human, uh, which, which was fascinating. So yeah, it, it does open up a lot of questions, but I, I think, you know, smarter than me researchers need to, to really look at it and see, like I said, there, there was some initial data from uh, a site called No More Marking that I just looked up yesterday it came out, um, that, that looked at their model. They were looking at younger students where, you know, I, I don't know if that was the impact on it, uh, they said it was not very effective. I think, um, you know, I, I think it can be for, for high school level, um, providing the feedback for, in, in what I've seen very limited. So I'm sorry that I don't have all the, yeah. the, the training background. I also wonder about divergence. I, I mean, these may be factually based essays, like for a region, say, um, a U.S. history exam, but I'm also wondering about divergent thinkers and writers um, and would their voices be assessed in um, a fair way? It's probably honestly less biased than human readers in terms of it is going to look at the content and, and the semantic structure of a sentence. Whereas a teacher is going to be biased by the gravity going to be biased by handwriting, spelling mistakes. Um, you know, there are all those things that, that, that the humans are looking at. And the AI is much more likely to say, well, you told me to look at these very specific things. That's all I'm looking at. And, and so, so it will follow the rubric. Aspects, it it, it will, will follow more likely rubric. follow the rubric without bias than a, right. than a human. Interesting. Right. And, and the, the, the current training processes for, for human test readers introduce unintended biases like you know all the the low scoring papers are short um connie encouraged me to ask a question that i had uh, which is partially uh, this is mark um to you joyce but more generally um you had mentioned use of translation for example in um writing to parents you know who may speak another language and then translating back and i guess there have been certain google translate is something i use but it is highly imperfect and i guess i i also i heard when the guy uh, from open ai whose name i didn't know sam, sam altman yes yeah, yeah. sam that translators jobs would be lost well, maybe for certain, I, I like what Chris said, for good enough translation, but translation is an art and, and translators see themselves as creators, not as mechanically transforming X to X prime. And so to me, I think we have to make a difference between good enough translation, which may be useful in certain contexts, and translation as an art form, as a creative act. And certainly when you're communicating with parents about their kids, relying on translation programs that may not be astute about metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the famous one that's always used is it's raining cats and dogs. Um, that, um, you know, I would just be hesitant at saying this, we've answered that problem rather than saying we have a, a good enough tool that we hope gets better. And, and yeah. yeah, so that's what I would And say. I think, I, Mark, that's an excellent point. I, you know, absolutely. Um, I, I want, you know, in, in a, the best of all possible worlds, I'd want the, uh, another speaker of the language to check my communication before I sent it out. 
you know, but, you know, one of the things we're all talking about here is satisficing in some way, isn't it? You know, is, 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 is AI generated text good enough? Is AI invented art good enough? And I'm honestly, the, the AI art I'm seeing is like astounding right now. But um, yeah, but it's a really good point. And we could make some serious mistakes and we could hurt feelings and do a lot of damage with that. On the other hand, as I know you can see as well, some communication with all the immigrant families we're going to be seeing in our schools may be better than no communication. Um, and we have a variety of tools to choose from. And the stuff I've been seeing that's part of Immersive Reader um, I don't know enough to know this, but people I've been testing it with have told me that it's pretty darn good. So um, the Microsoft products seem to be generating very good translation. And again, Mark, I just don't know enough, but you're right. Those are very, very important concerns. Um, I do want to get some, to some more questions. I, be, I bet we have a lot. Um, Rachel I, had a really good question. Rachel, Rachel? do you want to go on air here? Thanks, Rachel. Sorry, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm hiding from my small children. So sorry if it's very loud. Um, <laughs> that's, that's just fine. Go ahead, Rachel. So I work with teenagers right now. They are very excited about ChatGPT, as you can imagine. They are already using it. And as information professionals or future inf information professionals, I'm wondering what role we play in setting norms around how they cite the use of this kind of technology what the norms even are, how much they have to use it, like in that scenario where they use it to generate a first draft, but then submit a final draft, how much editing makes it their work product? Do they need to cite it? What do we do right now in this moment in encouraging them to, to be uh, honest in their use of it and really leverage that rather than run away from it? Who would like John would like to jump in? <laughs> great. Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. And I've been exploring some of the different uh, you know, variations on generative AI to see which some of them, like uh perplexity.ai gives you its sources, which is I think really important. And I think journalism should up the ante now. And I've argued to my colleagues in journalism for a long time that they should provide 100% transparency wherever possible. Uh, and this is a chance to do that now, to layer into every story, because everything's published digitally now, all your sourcing. So you can see everything. Where did every single fact come from? How was every single fact fact checked? And then you could, lay, you could layer in there exactly how you used AI. What did you use AI for? Where did you use it? How did you use it? And I think that's the kind of rubric we should teach our students is they should source everything and make that clear. So there could be like your, your document, the thing, you, your actual essay, then it should be like an accompanying thing that is how you did it. You know, it's like in a math assignment, you show your work. Well, this would be kind of the same thing, I guess, uh, to, uh, and then that way it could, I wouldn't say that. Then you wouldn't have to say don't use use it. Say yeah, use it. I just want to know exactly how you did use it, and you know, make it very clear, very specific. Well, but in math, we don't have to say, "Hey, I used a calculator." It's just a given. Well, in some so, cases, we I should go varies. back and revisit that. Maybe everything, how you did everything, should be stated in an accompanying document. I'll show you work journal, idea. I think it would be. I think it would be logical and appropriate to to list how you did everything. I agree. And I think that this is in some ways like an interview. I've seen um, um, sort of the first version of citations for chat GPT looking very much like an interview. Um, but I, I think we need to tell our students to be transparent about how they did their work, to encourage reflections on the process, um, and to talk about the prompt engineering that they did if they did that. Um, and we really, this, this tool is not going away, but I also want to make sure that we encourage creativity and honesty in our, in our students and in our, in our, in our schools, we have to establish new, new types of norms. I'm not going to not have it help me create an outline, but I'm certainly not going to present my, what's generated by chat GPT for, for my, as my own work. Right. Um, so Vic, you had a question, and then after that, we're going to go to closing comments, and I'm going to ask. Uh, I know. Uh, I know it's already five, almost five thirty, and I'm going to ask uh, Michael Lesk, the inestimable, <laughs> I can never say that word, Michael Lesk, to uh, to pipe in on some of his uh, his thoughts. But Vic, go ahead. You had a question. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to add to what uh, John mentioned that uh, I think uh, we have to again 
every time we ask students to submit anything related to their academic assignments, we expect a certain amount of uh, integrity from them. And I think when they're signing something saying like this is this work has been produced by me, we 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 want to believe them. So again, just giving them the options of uh, citing wherever they use language models and again, framing our assignments differently, because just like uh, math doesn't care about uh, math assignments, we don't care about calculators because our assignments goes beyond the use of calculators. Uh, in the same way, I think when we are creating assignments for other subjects, we have to account for the fact that uh, a language model might be used to write some in initial texts, but how can we go beyond that? We can ask the students to compare between what has been AI generated and what they prepared as a final version. We could ask them, like uh, John mentioned, what are they probably sourced their materials using uh, language models, chat GPT like things, or, or anything else. Like we have to be creative more in terms of how we generate those assignments. And I think that's the way going forward. So as academics, we have our uh, job I, shifting as well. I do want to suggest that a lot of the content that we would use as academics and encourage our secondary students largely to use is behind paywalls that at this moment, uh, chat GPT and num a number of the other tools are not getting to. Um, so for, for instance, for the systematic reviews, I believe Vic was talking about, they'd need to get into some proprietary content to be able to do that effectively. And it wouldn't be open. It wouldn't be an open access kind of thing. All right. Okay, Michael. Michael. <laughs> let's, let's hear. Okay, so just in case you don't know, that for the audience to know who uh, Michael Lesk is, Michael is a uh, dis are you distinguished professor, I think. No, not quite up there. Well, in my mind, you are. Uh, and one of the true innovators of technology and Unix in particular, you know. So Michael has been there from the very beginning. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. Oh, you're on mute yet. And I frequently point out to people, I've been reading AI hype since 1961, but for many decades, language translation was part of the hype. And now uh, it actually, as of sort of 2005, six, it actually works. So yeah, it took 50 years, but it showed up. <laughs> um, now, uh, this is not new. Until 1840, if you wanted a picture of somebody, you paid a portrait painter to do the job. And then Louis de Guerre and a few other people came up with photography. And most important, in 1888, George Eastman invented something he called the Kodak. And now anybody could take a picture of anyone without getting into a studio, and in fact, without their permission. And that was an ethical problem, which is why we have people arguing about a right to privacy. The first argument was whether it was okay to take a picture of a random person walking on the street. And for a while, Photography and portraits coexisted. If you go to the Morgan Library on Madison and 37th, you'll see a portrait of J.P. Morgan's wife, for which he paid John Singer Sargent a thousand pounds. Really good bar, sorry, a thousand guineas. Really good bargain. Uh, if you want to see Morgan himself, go to the Metropolitan. They have Edward Steichen's photograph of him. He wasn't willing to sit still for the length of time it would have taken a portrait painter. So we accustomed to the idea that, oh, um, painting a portrait is no longer going to be an essential part of life. Now, there are things a painter can do that a photographer can't quite yet do. If you say, I want this picture, but I want the person to look as if they're half the weight that they really are. Well, a painter can do that. Uh, until fairly recently, photography couldn't. Um, so I think we're going to wind up adjusting to, there are things people do, but they're different. Uh, they may be more or less lucrative. I think there are fewer people making a living 
as artists or musicians than there used to be. But the very top artists and musicians are making vastly more money than anybody did in the 19th century who was playing music or painting pictures. So we're going to see a rearrangement and you know that's the way it is. So it's not useful to be Luddites and say, we'll just destroy the new technology. Though Joyce mentioned Napster, that's the first reaction in the music industry was, we'll destroy it. And then Apple showed them they could actually make more money with it. But we do have to rethink that we want people to focus on what is creative. What bothers me the most is everybody who tries out chat, chat GPT finds that it makes stuff up. And that's sort of frightening. Uh, and I don't know how we're going to adjust our society to the idea that ordinary writers as well as politicians will feel free just to make things up. But I'm hoping that we can get to a world where there are expressive things that people do and there are routine things that computers do. Very well said. Uh, Thank you, Michael. Uh, the great rearrangement. That's, that's and that's we're left we're one. left with more questions than answers again. Indeed. <laughs> so we've only got four more minutes left. So I'd like to offer Vic, John, and of course Joyce a chance to give some closing comments. So I am going to be strict with time. So uh, John, go ahead and uh, take a thirty seconds oh, or so to. Okay, thank you. I mean, Michael already kind of gave a good closing comment, but I would just add that I think that at least in the realm of journalism and media, learning to use AI as a tool to improve the quality of our work, I think that's the real opportunity. And I think we need to, you know, be worried about when AI might hallucinate. But I think to find how we can use it effectively to do better work and to move us one step closer to truth, you know, if that's the mission of journalism, I think that could be a very good thing. Nicely put, John. Vic, how about you? Uh, I would just add on to that. I, should, I would say that they are extremely useful tools for productivity, efficiency, and uh, we should encourage our students as well as we should use it ourselves. I would just say careful usage because we know that there are problems, so we should not try to generalize it over everything. We have to acknowledge that there are biases, there are other problematic areas, which we will have to solve eventually. So just uh, being careful with the usage and uh, acknowledging the problems, I think that should help us going forward. Thank you. Okay, Joyce, you got three minutes. Bring us okay. on. Okay, as Michael said, we've been here before and we've had to adapt to change quite a bit. I am very excited about, as a, as a teacher, I'm excited about the potential. I'm excited about it improving my life as a writer and a creative person. Um, but I am also excited about setting new, new norms and, and creating ex opportunities for my students to create in, in more interesting and powerful ways. It is gonna cause disruption, it is gonna cause problems, and we have to work out norms for different professions and, and different workplaces. Um, I look forward to re revisiting this. Thank well, great. You. So oh. we actually have two more questions, two more minutes. If anybody wants oh, my. to, to uh, ask a question of our distinguished panel, let's do it. I know there's a couple questions in there that we wanted to get to. Hold on. Um, oh, the reference, what, what to do, what will the, where will reference librarians go? That was the question. Ah. I guess that one's for me. <laughs> no, Joyce, I oh, think Michael. realistically say that given the ease with which AI can synthesize anything, provenance and citation is going to be really important. So with luck, one of the skills of a reference librarian is going to be really important, being able to say to somebody, no, whatever was just said on TV isn't real. Someone just made it up and you need to know how to recognize that. Well, and with that, I think we're going to call our evening. Oh. Uh, 
see if I can get to my thank you. While slide. you're doing that, I just want to let you know that Chat GPT four or whatever the next version is is not the only tool. And recommending the right tools for research and reference is still going to be something that librarians are going to be very important in. They will our our, our users may not discover all of those tools, the new search tools and the tools for reference and citation chaining, they may not even be aware of that practice. So I see I see a different role for us and it, it probably a more technology-based role for us in, in the research and reference processes. Absolutely. All right, uh, with that, again, I'm going to uh, bid everyone farewell. This has been- Thank you. Mind blowing. I don't know. Uh, the great rearrangement. That's I'm going to adopt that. Michael, thank you for that. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, mostly thanks to Joyce for letting us launch your uh, library tech talks with colloquium. I think that's great. Uh, John, always a pleasure to see you. Vic, so nice to see you back at Sky. And with that, again, I bid you all adieu, go out and get some fresh air before it gets dark. All right. We'll stick around for a little bit. Um, if uh, there's any after questions, but with that, we'll see you later. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Michael, thank you so much for coming. Thank in. you. I'm not sure whether I should interpret the last.